So hi all, Cantor Joanna Alexander here. Um, our subject tonight is called Queer Jewish Texts, an, Expl an Exploration, not an explanation, an exploration. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's going to be next. Um, <laughs> so I will start by saying I am not an expert. I am a cisgender female, heterosexual woman. Um, so this is not an insider's exploration, but I am curious and I am a reader, and I brought with you the book with me today, the books that I turned to to prepare for this class. So if you like some of the things I have to say or are curious and you want to learn more, I just thought I would share the titles with you. Are they large enough for you to read from your screens or should I read them to you? Please read them, especially the first two on your right. Okay. So this book here is called Torah Queries, Weekly Commentaries on the Hebrew Bible. It is a week by Parsha Tashavua from a queer perspective written by many different rabbis um, and many different um, people. So an insider's guide, Parsha Tashavua, lots of top subjects covered all the way Bereshit to um, Bezot Habris. Um, this is called oh, The Sacred Encounter. It's published by the CCAR, the Central Conference for American Rabbis, which is the Reform Movement's Rabbinical Council, Rabbinical Publishing Arm. It is not just um, about LGBTQ. It is Sacred Encounter's Jewish Perspectives on Sexuality. And you get everything from a reinterpretation of Levitical laws um, prohibiting sex, prohibiting same-sex relationships, to um, explorations of Jewish communities that are polygamous, to explorations of how to be in a sacred, um, intimate relationship if you are not in the marrying state. So perhaps you are an adult who's not yet ready to get married, um, but you are trying to make your relationship sacred and not just one person after the next, or perhaps you are um, a widow or a widower and you want to um, explore a relationship, but you are not interested in remarrying. There's a chapter on what kinds of things make a sacred relationship um, from that perspective as well. This book is called The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Torah from a Transgender Perspective by Professor Joy Ladin. Joy is a transgender woman who is also a professor of English literature at Stern College. That is Yeshiva University's women's school. So just think about what that means that Yeshiva University's women's college employs a transgender woman. The book is beautiful. I'm gonna read a section from it tonight. Um, hopefully you will wanna learn more as well. And this book, I believe, is recently published. I know Jenny Gates Beckman told me that it is part of the library here, so you could even borrow this from this campus. It's called A Rainbow Thread Noam, by Noam Siena, an anthology of queer Jewish texts from the first century to 1969. So, you know, 1900 years of the existence of queer people in black and white. Not all of it positive, a lot of it speaking um, about it being a negative thing, but proving that, you know, this is not a new phenomena. There have always been people who did not conform to a gender binary, people who did not conform to a heteronormative culture. It has always existed. And we have in black and white where those things get discussed, even from a negative context throughout our historical record. So I think that brings me to a little of like, why are we here? Why are we exploring this? And I'm gonna start with a couple of really important whys. This is our community. The Jewish community of Omaha in the year 2022 and its entire history 
has included people who are not heterosexual, people who are not gender binary. They are Jews. They are humans. They have a right and a privilege of having access to God, of having access to community, of being seen and being heard and being part of our peoplehood. And we should be talking about what that means. And we should be embracing and understanding what it means when our traditions rub up against our friends, family, fellow human beings, humanity. So this is one of the big whys. I also, again, speaking as an as a ally outsider, as a, as a heterosexual woman, cisgender woman, I found in my research just eye-opening um, experiences of humanity and eye-opening explorations of God that I maybe could have found reading other things, but I don't know that I would have found them reading other things. The perspective brought to God, to Judaism, to Torah, by a person who has lived their whole life feeling other and excluded was eye-opening to the greater human experience and certainly to, to experience that I can relate to and understand. And so by intentionally exploring um, Torah through a transgender lens, Torah through a queer lens, I was able to see myself differently, see God differently. And that's, I would like to start by reading part from the introduction. So again, this book is The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Torah from a Transgender Perspective by Joy Ladin. This is from the introduction. She begins by saying, God never mistook me for the body others saw. God knew who I truly was and understood how alone I felt because God, like me, had no body. To make God visible, no human face beings could see. And then Joy speaks about how she connected through the story of Jonah that is um, part, of, of part of our Yom Kippur liturgy. This is a little bit of a long section, but I think it's really, it was so moving to me when I read it. And I would love to just share a couple pages with you. I was alone with God. All the things that cut me off from other people, my lack of a body that felt like mine, my inability to fit into gender categories, my sense of being utterly, unspeakably different made me feel closer to God. God knew who and what I was. God had created me, fitting my mismatched body and soul together. God was always there day and night as I tried to live and sometimes tried to die. We were an odd couple, me struggling with a body that didn't feel like mine, God existing beyond all that is was and will be. But when it came to relating to human beings, God and I had something in common. Neither of us could be seen or understood by those we dwelt among and loved. To me, that was eye-opening. Neither of us could be seen or understood by those that dwelt among the, we dwelt among and loved. And so as, for as long as I can remember, being transgender has brought me closer to God. That may seem strange. Both religious and non-religious people tend to think of transgender identities as inherently secular. But there are many religious people whose relationship with God have been profoundly shaped by being transgender because as they wrestled with suffering, isolation, and questions about who they were and how they should live, they, like other religious people, turned to God for understanding they couldn't find among human beings. Most religious traditions recognize that conditions that cut us off from other people can bring us closer to God. Every year at Yom Kippur, when Jews traditionally read the book of Jonah, which tells a story every transgender person knows, the story of someone desperate to avoid living as the person, in Jonah's case, as the prophet, they know themselves to be. From the beginning of the book, when God orders him to go at once to Nineveh and proclaim judgment upon it for the wickedness has come before me, Jonah knows he is a prophet. 
He runs away because, as he explains in the final chapter, he knows God won't destroy Nineveh no matter how wicked the people are. That is why I fled. I know that you are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and renouncing punishment. Even as God tells him of God's impending judgment, Jonah, as befit a prophet, already knows that God will spare them. Sorry, I'm skipping a little. God's anger by telling God he would do, um, Jonah tries to appease God's anger by telling God he would do what God ordered him to do. Jonah's self-destructive response reflects a psychological pattern that is all too familiar among transgender people. Flee from yourself as long as you can. And when you can no longer endure the internal and external storms, kill yourself for the sake of others so you can avoid have, ever having to live with who you are. Jonah may have thought he was killing himself for the sake of the sailors, but the truth is that he was so desperate to avoid living as a prophet, he, will, he is as the prophet he is, that he prefers not to live at all. Transgender people often tell ourselves that suicide will resolve the conflict between their need to be and not be who we really are. Our families, our communities, our world will be better off without us, we think. And we, released from the shame of hiding and the terror of living as who we are, will finally be at peace. In Jonah's case, the suicidal fantasy seems to come true. When Jonah is thrown overboard, the sea stops raging and he sinks peacefully into the depths, into the heart of the sea, where he is swallowed by a few huge fish. But Jonah miraculously doesn't die. In the depths of the sea, in the belly of the fish, Jonah finds himself alone with the God he fled. God literally surrounds him, providing him with breath, warmth, and protection, sustaining his life in the midst of death. In other words, Jonah's flight from himself leads him simultaneously closer to death and closer to God. The spiritual paradox is at the heart of his story. And it, is, it was at the heart of the story of my life when I was living as the man I knew I wasn't. One last paragraph. Unlike Jonah, I experienced God as preserving me in the depths rather than delivering me to life. God didn't want me to live as who I really was, I told myself. God wanted me and was helping me to submerge my true self forever. That's what love is, I told myself, pretending to be what others want you to be, suffering in silence, embracing loneliness, giving up on joy. Year after year, when the ram's horn blew on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, I wept, not because I was repenting for my sins, but because I knew that no matter how heartfelt my confession, as long as I lived as a man, I would never feel grateful or even truly alive. God could preserve my life in the depths of suicidal despair, but even God could not deliver me from the depths until I did what Jonah did, except that I had to live as who I truly was. Reading God and Torah from a transgender perspective. I think that as a cantor, as a clergy person, as a member of Jewish community, if we don't understand that a huge part of our religion is trying to reach those who are isolated and feel alone, then we're missing a huge part of the goals of community. To read so viscerally Joy's experience of exile and loneliness and 40 years of suicidal ideation, of believing that that was the definition of love, and yet feeling God with her that whole time, that was eye-opening. It was shocking. It was beautiful to understand God differently. I, 
I grew up, you know, in a, in a time where we were changing the language for God from he to you or from Lord to Adonai or to eternal, where we were adding imahot, the women, into our avot begivurot prayer. I grew up having to reinterpret and understand God language with non-gendered identity, even as the words might have been gendered, Lord he but to expand our understanding of god as this being that also maybe feels lonely and unseen unlistened to without body without proper description without category i found that really beautiful are there any thoughts or questions before i move to a next section i just wondered on that i thought it was very powerful too i I, my feeling is also i felt very sorry for for her you know that it it seems to me to be a a devastating thing to go through and 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 in a sense see when when she says god made me that way that's where i have a little bit trouble because you know god can make mistakes you know in the sense that you know sometimes babies are born with no brain or they're born with you know, horrible disfigurements. Those are mistakes, genetic mistakes, translocation of chromosomes, that kind of thing. And so this I see as a kind of mistake, not to be condemned, not to be seen as immoral, but something to be, be sympathetic about. And 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 I, I just I totally agree that this she should be or he should be part of the Jewish people, but my concern would be not to insist that they fit into proper Judaism, not proper, but Orthodox Judaism, that that would be asking, you know, the Orthodox Judaism to to compromise what they truly believe. Well, so I think this is obviously a huge um, question. I think Joy spent the better part of her life um, forcing herself to make other people pleased, to respect and honor the important things that other people valued, the importance of what boyhood meant, what manliness was, what space men played in Judaism. For 40 years, Joy subsumed her identity to please other people's needs. And for 40 years, there was suicidal ideation through that process. If we want to embrace the fullness of humanity of God's creations, of all human beings being created in the image of God, B'Tselem Elohim, I think it's really important to think about whether we truly have it right, whether we are actually understanding God's will in a separation of a binary or a gender conformity or a role that men play and that women play and a role that heterosexuality or homosexuality play, or whether there is humanity mixed in to that historical understanding. And what is the ultimate priority? Does God who says you are created but Salam Elohim in the image of God. It is not good for man to be alone. God is a God of love. If those an overarching value that should be prioritized or a 2000 year tradition that has been uncomfortable with um, different forms of identity, different forms of sexuality. The reform movement has chosen to understand the values of B'Tselem Elohim, man should not be alone, and God's love as a priority. That is not necessarily how other forms of Judaism have chosen to prioritize. But I think that to, to, to ask a human to put themselves into a box for everybody else's comfort denies that human being, their humanity, their access to God, their access to community. That's an I statement. I think that. Other communities will have to make decisions, but those decisions have real life consequences that cause real life pain. 
Um, I want to move to- You put that beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I saw there were some chats, but I'm not sure if there were questions or if Karen was sharing. Um, um, I think she's asking resources. people to put questions or to raise their hand right now. Awesome. I appreciate that. Anybody online? If there's anything else there, Karen? No, I've been just sharing sort resources and uh, chat. Thank you. I appreciate that. So well, I want to. Karen, one thing I, I yeah. wanted to mention. For the longest time, I think, and this is Mark speaking, um, for the longest time, it seems like society has treated differences as mistakes or something that's wrong or something that, that is, and, and maybe it's time, at least I think it's, it's time to think about that in a different way in much the same way that you're categorizing it now. It's, the, it's not a mistake. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. I mean, perhaps it is, um, perhaps it is a mistake. We can call a biological, a chromosomal switch or um, um, a mutation that leads to some sort of birth defect or some sort of cancer or some sort of whatever. We can call that a mistake in biological terms, but that is in fact placing judgment on God's design and God's creation. Um, and we might be wrong on that judgment. Um, I, I'm not, I don't know if God is perfect. I don't know if God's creation is perfect. I accept Joy and her words that she experienced this trauma, this, this challenge with God, as opposed to believing that she was a mistake from God. It's a nice, well-rounded way to say it. So I want to turn a little bit to some text. Okay, we've got one question. Oh, Lenore yes, has her hand up. Hi, Mom. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, in terms of human sexuality, um, we've certainly known for centuries and centuries that there is such a thing as homosexuality. But the whole transgender um, knowledge is relatively new certainly for me, I never heard of it growing up. I don't think I heard of it when you were growing up. Um, <laughs> I think as that we as people are only at the beginning of understanding that gender is a lot more complex than we used to think it was. So it was like, you were male or female and maybe you loved people who were the same. But now we know there is a range, there's a spectrum, there are many different, different places along that. Um, and, I, and I do believe that the, most, the two most important words in the Hebrew Bible are B'Tselem Elohim. So wherever somebody falls in that spectrum, I believe they're in the image of God and none of them are a mistake. And we as cis people, we need, we, it's on us to try to understand where those other people are coming from. And at the very least, accept it when they say what they are. Thank you. Because I think there are people out there who simply don't accept it. They don't think it's real. So I, I understand that it wasn't a term that I grew up with or that you grew up with. I think that there is a lot of humanity built into our um, lack of knowledge. And I'm going to, I, I see Eileen's hand, but I'm going to just transition to one text before we get there. Our Mishnah, the Mishnah is compiled around the two, year 200 of the Common Era, identifies four different genders, okay? Right, so if we understand that in, the 20th century, only binary men and women existed. That means that we spent 1800 years forgetting something that the rabbis were talking about at the year 200. The Mishnah identifies four genders, Zachar, male, Nekeva, female, Tamtam, and Androgynos. Tumtum and androgynos are a little harder for me personally to understand exactly what the, what the rabbis meant by those words. My understand is that the best 
Modern word for tum-tum would be an intersex person. And the best modern word for androgynous would be a person who has um, sex organs that are identically both. So perhaps has both a penis and a clitoris. I'm not clear what that actual medical term would be, but those seems to be what the Mishnah is speaking about. Now the Mishnah is not trying to understand identity or what you feel like or what you want. They are trying to understand what category to put you in. Are you allowed to marry a woman? Are you allowed to marry a man? Are you required to observe male rituals? Are you not required because you are more closely identified with the female category? Therefore, you are not obligated to certain rituals. That is what the Mishnah's goal is, not how do you feel, but to recognize as a person who might think that they are the only person who ever didn't fit neatly into a male or female category, that 1800 years ago, our rabbis identified that there were more than just two categories and that they had full humanity with obligations to God, with relational work is extremely eye-opening. And again, goes back to the idea that if we didn't grow up learning this language, there are changes that language has had. Transsexual was a word. Now we often call it transgender. These, these are words that change with time. But a lot of that is because of intentional erasure and intentional forgetting. Intentionally preventing people from sharing their stories. Killing people whose stories included um, LGBTQ life. Um, and deleting that from history, including deleting from history that somebody who was a hero somewhere also happened to have a homosexual relationship and just not mentioning that when we learn about them in history class. Eileen, did you want to add something? I see you're unmuted, but I cannot hear you. Sorry, Eileen. I heard you earlier. <laughs> All right. I am going to jump. And Eileen, if it winds up working, feel free to jump in at some point. I'm going to jump to, as I said, this is called A Rainbow Thread, an anthology of queer Jewish texts from the first century to 1969. I am going to jump to, um, again, what I will call, this has always been the case. A, Elaine Temper to everybody. What about Leviticus 18.22? Is there a larger question or just how do we interpret that? Sorry, I didn't hear you. I was wondering what your what your what your chat well, in, in Leviticus 18.22, it says a man should not lay down with a man. You know, they are going to get stoned and killed because right. that's what God says. Correct. Okay, so I'm gonna, I can give a very short of what I think answer, but I'm gonna encourage in this book, there is a beautiful and not short essay by Rabbi Dr. Nancy Weiner um, about reinterpreting that particular line, Toevan, and what do we understand it to be and where does it come from and how to, how to um, you know, halakhically reinterpret it. You don't have to agree with the interpretation. It's not necessarily um, the most obvious, but it is a really great um, way to re-understand it and to reinterpret it. There's another essay in here about reclaiming that portion as, um, uh, as a way to see ourselves and understand ourselves different and not just try to kind of ignore it or hide it because it is uncomfortable and causes harm to people who, who read it without a broader explanation. My very short explanation, I do not believe that the Torah is the perfect word of God handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai. I believe there's a lot of humanity and godly inspiration. And I think that the, the humanity wanted there to be procreation. The humanity was uncomfortable with the, um, 
sexuality or sexual expressions of the cultures that surrounded them. And like so many other things, they said to, they set themselves apart in their relationship with God by behaving differently than how the cultures around them related to their um, polytheistic gods. Um, that does not mean that you can easily get from there to homosexuality is okay and we should put kedushin on same-sex marriage. It takes a lot of years to get there. It takes a lot of interpretation to get there. And as I said at the beginning, it takes a choice that the Tzalem Elohim, man should not be alone, and God's love are overarching values that are more important than the specificity of that particular toiba. So I encourage you to read the essay. Yeah. I personally do not believe in it, but I was just, I was in a class and we were just discussing that two nights ago. Yeah. And that's why it was so in my mind. And um, we sort of in the class sort of agreed with the more conservative look as compared to the Orthodox who strictly go by that. Right. And I think that the Orthodox community, if they do strictly go by that, um, need to look at what are the consequences. I am not saying that they should change their mind for me. What is the harm to the Jewish people caused by holding to a strict shot interpretation of that text? What happens to your children, grandchildren, siblings who grow up learning that and cannot conform to that in their lives? Do they leave Judaism entirely? Do they feel alienated by their religion of their parents? Do they find a different form of Judaism? What are the consequences of that narrowness? That is not necessarily a motivating factor to change your interpretation. It is, however, a consequence of not changing your interpretation. I'm going to read from you to you some poetry written um, in the 11th century of Spain. These are uh, the poetry. Let me find the right page so I can actually give a give a good introduction because I'm new to these people and these poets. But I thought that it would be interesting. So. Poetry of Shmuel Hanagid, 11th century Spain. I will read you an introduction that tells you a little bit about who, who Shmuel Hanagid is. He's from Granada. He's a poet and a politician. And the, our love songs dedicated to a beautiful youth referred to as a fawn, Svi or Ofer. So that's a, a, um, a metaphor. And in the final poem, usually as a goza, uh, gozal, a chick, which it puns both the Arabic gazelle and gazal, love poem. So um, in Granada, Spain, the Jewish community was living in very close proximity to the Arabic community, following the form of um, art, which included poetic forms, um, and following the to you know in, being influenced by the art and the culture and the um, literature and the um, science of the time for themselves. Shmuel Nagid, um, he fled to Cordoba in 1013 for Granada, from Cordoba to Granada, where he served as both a Nagid, the head of the local Jewish community, as well as a vizier and general to the Amir, one of the highest political positions achieved by a Jew in medieval Europe. Um, so, He's not just some artist. He's the head of the Jewish community. You don't get there by not knowing anything, right? And he's a vizier to the head of the political system in Granada, right? So he's enmeshed in the elite of society, politically, Judaically, knowledgeably, and he's also writing poems that um, are clearly homoerotic. This poem number two. That's it. I love the fawn, plucking roses from your garden. You can put the blame on me, but if you once look, looked at my lover with your eyes, your lovers would be hunting you and you'd be gone. 
That boy who told me, pass some honey from your hive, I answered, give me some back on your tongue. And he got angry, yelled, shall we too sin against the living God? I answered, let your sin, sweet master, be with me. And he said fawn stood for what? Fawn stood for a young boy or a youth. Don't, don't you find that grotesque in a lot of ways? I am reading what he wrote, and I am trying not to judge. No, so well, there okay. is a common, um, the earlier text of this goes um, um, from earlier history to later history. Losing my language here. Um, so the earlier history, um, we know that the Greco-Roman history included um, a hierarchy of older people in relationship with younger people that in modern times we would absolutely find grotesque and inappropriate, pedophilia, um, unacceptable behavior, certainly boundary crossing for modern times. It was a part of the culture of the time. That does not make it a good thing, but it was a true thing. It was a part of the culture of the time. We do not know whether Shmuel HaNagid um, had relationships with young boys. We don't know if he had relationships with any boys or men. We know that he wrote poetry about it and that he was at a high political state for both the secular, right? The Amir position and the Judaic position. I'm just wondering why you said not, you don't want to judge that I'm curious. Because God judges, Joanna doesn't judge. So you don't judge when someone says no, like Leviticus, you were saying you were concerned about that. Um, I, I believe that I believe in consent and I believe that consent cannot happen if there is a huge age difference. And I also understand that that is a consequence of the time and period that I live in. Okay. The idea of consent, as we understand it in 2022, did not exist in 1975, did not exist in 1900, did not exist in the year 200. So I cannot judge the same kinds of relationships that I would say that's gross. I'm not going to tell somebody who is 75 who wants to marry somebody who's 25 that that is completely wrong and illegal, even if I personally think that it's a little creepy and a little gross, but maybe that actually relates to somebody that we're speaking to right now. I don't know. However, a 75 year old and a 25 year old are both of age of consent, according to Jewish law and American law and American understandings of norms in this day and age. And so I don't have to like it. It is okay. If you have very vast dynamics of difference, the 75 year old is the 25 year old person's boss, teacher, um, rabbi. Those are different things than just an age difference. So I don't know what youth means. Does youth mean an 18 year old to a 25 year old or does youth mean a seven year old? What is a seven year old doing? A 13 year old is becoming bar mitzvah, which I tell my students when I'm teaching them for bar mitzvah, when you become bar mitzvah responsible for the commandments, you are also getting ready to get married, have a career, leave your parents' household. Today, a 13 year old is not of a majority age, would not be eligible for giving consent just because they may or may not be physically capable of having children. Doesn't mean that we would think it would be appropriate for us to marry them off and permit them to have children. That is a change we, that we legitimate every bar and bat mitzvah. Every time we bring a child to Torah, we call them an adult while then sending them off to their room in curfew because they don't even have a driver's license. So we, we change our understandings and we change our judgments of things all the time. Um, I will just note that there are poets, there's poetry in here from the same time period um, by Yitzchak Ibn Mar Shaul, 
who um, who I am not, um, Ibn Marshaul described the emotions of lovesickness caused by the sight of his beloved, who is compared to a beautiful male figure from the Bible, like Joseph or like David. There is poetry by um, Shlomo Ibn Gavriel, who is um, also from the same time, time period, um, but I, I, I had heard of him, I had studied him in college, I no longer remember exactly who he was. Poetry by um, Yehuda Halevi, who wrote a um, very famous book called the Kuzari. This poem begins, once I fondled him upon my thigh, I caught his own reflection in my eye and kissed my eyes, deceitful imp. I knew it was his image I kissed, not my eyes. Some actually very beautiful poetry, some that I don't understand because poetry is not my area of expertise. Poetry by Yehuda al-Haziri, poetry by Moshe Ibn Ezra, who is one of the um, medieval scholars that we study next to Maimonides and Rashi when we study Torah and Talmud. Um, poetry by, um, um, I had a couple names, sorry. By Colonymous, I think is his name, Colonymous, Ben Colonymous. I lost the page. I'll find it eventually. But lots of different things. And again, going to, this is, a, this is not poetry. This is an um, archaeological record from the Cairo Geniza. They found an amulet, a love amulet between two men. So again, this goes to um, existence of humanity versus erasure, right? The Cairo Geniza is essentially a garbage pit that we have now used as an archaeological landmine to uh, archaeological boom to find ancient Sidorim and study how the prayers changed over the course of time to find ancient Torah scrolls, to find marriage documents and legal documents. It, it was a, a trash can that we that got preserved and now we get to study and learn about our peoplehood over time because of it. In the Cairo Geniza, they found an example of an amulet text with a spell to ensure love between two men. It is undated, but probably comes from the late 12th century and was made for a prominent local scholar, a contemporary of Maimonides, Yehuda Bar Yoshia. Like other love spells from the Geniza, so this is a common form of um, writing that you would go to an expert to make for you, Yehuda here appeals to the power of angelic and divine names to inflame the heart of a man named Hodaya Bar Shlomo, reworking verses from Psalms and Song of Songs to include their names. The back of the amulet contains another magical spell asking for favor in the eyes of the rulers and scholars and protection from enemies. So this, it's normal. You do the normal thing. You go to the whatever and you get your love spell and you wear it or you bury it or you give it to the person that you love and you hope that it turns their heart to you. Does that same exact normal thing, but does it one man to another man? And what happens? Nobody says no. The person who makes the amulet makes them an amulet. Not such a big deal. The amulet says Yehuda bar dot, 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 meaning that they don't know what the inscription would have said, yod hey vav hey shaddai eh yeah. Then there's like a whole bunch of letters that I don't know what they stand for. I demand from you and I ask of you the names, dot, dot, dot. I adjure you to inflame Hodaya bar Shlomo for Yehuda bar Sh um, Yoshia, right? This isn't a secret. He puts his name and the name of the man that he loves together on the amulet and tells the person to write it down, right? Many waters cannot quench love and rivers cannot wash it away. If Hodaya bar Shlomo were to give all the wealth of his house to Yehuda bar Yehoshia, he would be utterly scorned. That is a quote from Song of Songs. As the deer pants for the streams of water to the soul of Hodaya bar Shlomo pants for you. Yehuda bar Yoshaya, um, Psalms 42 says, and he shall come to him swiftly and speedily. Amen, amen, Salah, finished. This great secret is 
designated to be a, a sharp word in the hand of Yehuda by Yoshaya, born of M-Y-A-M, meaning they don't know exactly what the name is. In the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned between the cherubim, I am that, I am Adiraran Akatrael. I don't know what Adiraran and Akatrael are, but clearly God's name, yud heh vav is in here. And there are quotes from Song of Songs, quotes from Psalms, quotes the Lord of hosts, right? They are using Judaic language, biblical language to take this secular amulet and use it. And nobody is, is questioning whether that is appropriate or inappropriate. Interestingly, if you turn to, if, if I turn to, if you turn to, you don't have it in front of you, sorry. Um, there are a couple of really interesting um, responses where somebody asks, I, I don't know if I marked it, so I'm gonna have some trouble finding it. Somebody asks about um, a synagogue. Is the synagogue still kosher if they caught I think the Shamish having a homosexual relationship in the synagogue, right? Like this is the responsa. And the responsa really deals with the question of um, can a synagogue be made not kosher? But the very fact that the responsa does not deal with the relationship itself, does not answer a condemnation of the shamish or say that he should be banished and not be allowed to be the shamish or that they should be stoned to death or that they should be exiled from the community. They just don't deal with it at all. Tells you something about society. Compare that to what's happening in this country with rules constantly being enacted into law, preventing uh, speech about homosexuality, preventing freedom of movement in bathrooms, preventing freedom of changing your gender um, gender notation on your license plate. Like we're not in a society that just knows that it's a true fact and we are just letting it exist. We're in a society where one group of people is saying, we are here get used to it. You need to allow us to be, even if it makes you uncomfortable. And another group of people saying, how dare you make us uncomfortable? We're going to make laws preventing you from making us uncomfortable. That's not true. That's not true that the laws are not preventing people not from making all. other people uncomfortable. They can uncomfortable. express themselves like crazy. I don't agree that that is the in, reality in, of in laws. Fact, too much. I mean, I don't agree that that's the reality of law. I, I do not agree that if you are prevented from changing your gender by, from on, on your license, if you are prevented from expressing um, from expressing or learning or learning that gay people exist, yes. that you are free to be whatever you want. The laws, the what is the law in Florida called? It's called the yeah. um, it's called the uh, the locally, the don't say gay bill, but parental rights and education, the, the rights of parents, the rights of parents, I think, is the title. Yeah. of the law. OK, what about the rights of the parents of gay children, the they rights they, of the gay parents? They got plenty of rights, but not to bring in. You don't teach homosexuality to third graders. And my point but, is that is not what's happening in these Well, I know they're wrong, but that's okay. I'm so I, I glad mean, that you think they're wrong. I mean, I mean, the reason why a lot of ministers or rabbis don't want to officiate at a gay ceremony, first of all, I wouldn't do it, officiate if I were a clergy, because it makes me nauseated to think of Thank two Thank you. Before, I appreciate that. You are telling a community that you are in front of who includes gay people yeah. and transgender people that they nauseate you. Yes. Great. But they're absolutely Thank you for seeing their humanity. I see their humanity. Eileen, would you like to speak? And is your microphone working properly? We'd, we'd also like to get to uh, to uh, Ari, who has some things in the chat as okay, well. Okay, I can't see the chat. Um, Eileen's hand is up. I don't know if she can unmute or not. Karen, can you help her unmute? Because she's on yeah, the Yeah, I'm trying her. 
her computer's been a bit cranky lately, so she may I'm be so having sorry. some issues. I do not wish you to be silent. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank can you, you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. It wasn't letting me unmute, I but Karen that. helped me, like always. Thank you. Okay, so um, Pat, the fact that I'm a lesbian, obviously I take offense at the person that says I nauseate them because not only am I a board member, but I'm an active member of the community who does a lot for the community. Lesbians and for you to say that I nauseate you is kind you of bizarre because... Let her talk. Yeah, but she doesn't nauseate you. That's what you said. No, I said gay so women. Anyway, not, not gay women. Oh, well, that's even worse to say that men nauseate you and women don't. You know, that's almost like when you watch pornographs, uh, people love the fact that it's women and women. I mean, what's the difference of the sex, whether it's men or women who love each other or transgendered or, you know, whatever, you really have no opinion about that because as Joanna stated, God judges us. We should not be judging what people have decided of their own free will to do. I mean, I'm not hurting anyone. Actually, my son has to be the most wonderful, generous person raised by two women. And there's many of gay pe people who raise children that are uh, well being and have no issues. They can be heterosexual or they can also be gay, whatever they want to be, because we teach them that it is not wrong for people to love another person. It doesn't have to be a woman or a man. It's up to them who they love. And you can't really say to someone that's gross or that's disgusting or you're a mistake by, by having that opinion. And actually some children at a very young age know that they're gay and they don't let anyone know because it's frowned upon. And so teaching the child at third grade that there are people that are gay actually won't hurt them. So I, I disagree with what you're saying. Thank, Thank you, Eileen. Joanna. Thank you, Eileen. Um, Mom, do you want to say something also? Yeah. Um, some of what you were uh, referring to, these old texts, just put me in mind of the, the novels, Rashi's Daughters. Um, and I don't know if this was actually true in what's portrayed in the book, or if it simply depicts the kind of thing that did happen. But um, these are there are three novels, one for each of Rashi's daughters, so medieval Jews. Um, and the husband of one of the daughters goes off for months and months at a time to study with a rabbi far away. And he has homosexual sex while he's away because he's only with other men and he comes home and he tells his wife um, and he, in this case, realizes that this is actually more fulfilling for him. But the, the fact that these rabbis, rabbinic students were apparently engaging in homosexual sex when they were away from their wives at least in the book is portrayed as this is just kind of what happened. Um, and there's no, there's no condemnation of it. I don't know how common it was. Um, I don't know if it was the case with one of Rashi's sons-in-law or not, but it was uh, certainly, I would say when I read it, I was, I was a little surprised. <laughs> so I, I would say that there probably is no textual evidence that that is a true story. It is a novel after right. all. But I do think that it would be, um, it, it is the exact same time period as this poetry that we're talking about takes place. It would not be uncommon for that to be a possibility. Elaine, I see your hand. Well, talking about having two mothers or two fathers, I have a problem, I live in Florida. I have a problem here if a, a second grader says to the teacher, how come he has two mothers, or how come he has two fathers? That teacher could be brought up on charges if she answers him. I think that's horrible. I, I 
agree. I also think that one of the things that we're learning is that the teachers are scared for themselves. My, te- my children who are in elementary school, they know what their teachers, mostly husbands, because almost all their teachers are women, um, what their names are, what they do for a living. If you were a teacher in a gay relationship, would you be going backwards in time to a much earlier time period, putting yourself back in the closet, not allowed to tell your students that you are married to somebody of the same sex or same gender? Oh, this is my wife, my husband. I have a picture of them on my desk like all my other teachers do. It is unclear whether that is legal or illegal um, based on this law, but it is very clear that a parent who doesn't like it is permitted to sue the school over it. Whether they would win is unclear, but encouraging the lawsuit is what the law seems to do. And the law is written so vaguely that theoretically you could say it about a heterosexual couple that, and there's a letter that's going around the internet that falls in the category of malicious compliance. Teacher says, okay, because of how this law is worded, we're going to take out every book that has gendered references because if we can't talk about gender, you know, at this age, no one gets mentioned, heterosexual, straight, you know, non-binary, whatever, it's not getting mentioned because we don't know who's going to sue. Could be it. What if, you know, theoretically, gay parents could sue because straight was mentioned, you know, if you want to get technical because of how the law is worded. Um, So I want to just pick, I think we have one last text. I don't know if it's the best text to end with, but it's a text I'm going to end with. It says from Avot de Rabbi Natan. So this is a book of Mishnah, I'm sorry, a book of Midrash. And this particular section is being based on the statement from the Mishnah from Pirkei Avot, appoint for yourself a teacher and acquire for yourself a companion. Um, So this is again, Midrash, that is story interpretation, filling in the blanks of the law. Acquire for yourself a companion. The word for companion is chaver from Mishnah Avot. How is this to be done? This teaches that a man should acquire for himself a companion and he should eat with him, drink with him, read with him, study with him, sleep with him, and reveal to him all his secrets, the secrets of Torah and the secrets of the worldly matters. For when they sit and occupy themselves with Torah and one of them makes an error in a matter of legal reasoning, or in recalling a citation, or if he declares an impure thing to be pure, or a pure thing to be impure, or a forbidden thing to be permitted, and a permitted thing to be forbidden, then his companion will return him to correct reading. And from where in scripture can we learn that when his companion guides him and studies with him, that they receive good reward for their labor? As it is said, two are better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor. From Ecclesiastes. Is Avod de Rabbi Natan suggesting that a chaver, a chavruta, a study partner, is by definition have a sexual component? No. But a vodah rabbi natan shows an intimate relationship that is expected between male study companions. And to assume that none of those male study companions took the intimacy of their relationship into a physical aspect would be, I think, folly and shows that there's a lot of humanity in our rules. There's a lot of humanity in our interpretations. There's a lot of humanity trying to decide what natural, what is godly, what is okay and not okay. And so again, we're not speaking of theoretical humans. Man, some of this is theoretical, but in the room today, we're not speaking of th- theoretical humans. We're speaking of each other. We're speaking of community members. We're speaking of creating a community that lives by Torah and understands that Torah must speak to humans who are non-binary, to humans who do not only have heterosexual love, and that those humans are part of us, part of our community, have access to God, access to faith, access to tradition, access to humanity, access to everything that the Jewish community of Omaha is, 
And that is why I'm here teaching tonight. Thank you all.